So just take a minute and set your motivation. Taya ta om mune mune maha mune so a taya ta om mune mune maha mune so a taya Connecting with motivation. So uh, your meditation was from Lama Yeshi, from your book, Ego, Attachment, and Liberation. Um, did most of you have a chance to do it? Yeah, yeah um, how did it go? Did you have any thoughts or impressions just from that particular style or his word choices or anything like that? Um, if you haven't had a chance to do it, it's in, it's in your book. I just read straight from his book, Ego, Attachment, and Liberation. Um, yeah, any thoughts on the Lama Yeshi style? He also gives some um, interesting techniques for overcoming distractions and dullness that are different than the normal antidotes we talk about, that are much more tantric. Um, although he doesn't go into all the details, um, it's really utilizing the inner winds to, you know, clear the mind and things. So that's embedded within the text. That's not something that I led you through because who knows what distractions you're having. But um, it's something interesting to know about that text. Um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. Give me some impressions. He likes to use the word ego a lot. And when he says ego, he means, you know, self-grasping ignorance. Um, you know, he's not necessarily educated in Freud. Um, he only knew what the hippies told him. Um, <laughs> so when he says ego, he means self-grasping ignorance. Um, that's one point. Um, he likes to describe things in terms of like our mental bureaucracy. You know, that we have kind of all these kind of beliefs and ideals and structures within our mind. And we don't even acknowledge that we built them or created them, but we become dictated by them and they lead us to suffering. So he kind of describes things in a slightly different way, trying to be, you know, accessible and relatable. Um, some of it's a little bit dated, you know, because it was taught in the 70s and 80s. Um, and some of it's very relevant now. But um, that book is based on a five-day meditation course that he led and it gives some really good explanations on how to meditate on quite deep concepts with very simple techniques so um, anyway have a little read through when you feel like it sometimes we'll look at it in class and sometimes we won't but it's basically a book on how to meditate on Mahamudra Zogchen um, the emptiness of the mind using very very simple ways of describing it so yeah Okay, so we're on page 65 of the main text. So in the middle of page 65, there's a little reflection, which, um, which I think is useful for us to go through. So it says, when the sutra says, if you realize the nature of your mind, it is wisdom. Therefore, cultivate thorough discrimination, not to seek Buddhahood elsewhere. What does it mean? What does it mean? So whether you feel comfortable speaking up or not, sit with the question for a second, that first reflection. And if you have some thoughts come up, do share. If you realize the nature of your mind, it is wisdom. Therefore, cultivate thorough discrimination, 
not to seek Buddhahood elsewhere. It's, um, it's directly related to the reading prior to it. Um, if you were just to kind of guess and just kind of, you know, take a chance, what do you think that means? Even very basically, no fancy language or anything, just what do you think that means? Yeah, Orna. When you understand the nature of your mind, then you are there. So you don't have to search anywhere else. If you really meet the clear knowing or the clear mind or this presence. Yep, exactly. That's, that's one half. That's exactly one, one half that you need to do. What's, if you were to guess, what's the other half? That was perfect. So there's realizing, understanding the nature of the mind being clear and knowing, and then there's understanding, realizing the nature of the mind that is, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> empty of, uh, empty like uh, everything else, yeah. Yay! <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, look, I know it seems kind of silly in like school to like make you say it out loud, but even if you know to say it out loud, plants it more firmly in your mind. Um, even if you're saying it out loud in your head, kind of like, okay, what's being referred to here is the nature of the mind is clear and knowing relatively, empty of inherent existence, ultimately. I don't have to go searching for another meditation object. I don't have to find wisdom outside of myself. All that I need to uproot negative habits is within me, recognizing it, and then seeing the reality of it. Recognizing it and seeing the reality of it. So when we're doing these meditations on the clarity of the mind, we're mainly looking at trying to recognize the relative nature of the mind. And then gradually we're gonna move into having identified that, see that it is empty of inherent existence. So right now we're just trying to figure out what is consciousness like besides the surface chatter, besides the immediate impressions of the senses. Um, even when the mind is quiet, there's still conception present. What is there besides that, that kind of process? Um, Osnat, did you have something you wanted to add? I just, I thought of the meditation on Monday. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And I just remembered that I was sitting there and feeling I don't know if it was spacious. I know that nothing, no idea got in space. Spacious. Am I just gazing or what is it? Like, I thought it was just, you know, gazing and. Yeah. 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 I mean, we have to play with it. That, the space. It's, you know, you're moving, we're all moving in the right direction with it. It's the, you know, the balance that we're trying to strike is to understand the difference between spacious and spacey, right? The difference between relaxation and dullness. Yeah, the difference between clarity, focus, and tension. You know, these are the different kind of balances we're trying to strike. So. You know, being aware of one technique to become aware of the clear and knowing nature of the mind is to do this technique of looking for the gaps between thoughts, like looking for the gaps between clouds. And it's not like there are gaps where you go from conception to perception so rawly, so, you know, orchestrated. Um, but there is, you know, there is a clarity that is always there together with at the same time as any kind of busyness of the mind. And sometimes the mind's busyness has words and content and impressions. And sometimes the busyness of the mind is more like static or kind of a dull white noise or a dull nothing in particular. You know, I was, um, I remember when I was doing these meditations in the beginning, I used to say to my dad, there's no moment of mind without words. And he said, well, for you, <laughs> for me, there's plenty of moments of time without words, you know? So it's not like conception is always words. Um, it just depends on your personality, obviously. 
Um, and, you know, so it's not like if you have a moment of, of meditation where you feel all the words quiet down and you feel all the impressions quiet down. It's not like that is perception necessarily. There are still conceptualizations happening, but there is a quieting, um, which is allowing a closer access to the spacious clarity, which is the primary mental consciousness. So it's kind of like you're trying not to have a war with your thoughts. You're trying to have a different relationship with them. You know, you're not trying to push them away. You're not trying to ignore them with harshness. It's more like um, if you know that your kids are fed and watered and happy and entertained, but they still keep tugging on your shirt and saying, mommy, look at me. And you go, yes, darling, I see you. And then you go back to what you're doing. You know, it's not like you like push them away in their face and say, bugger off. You say, yes, darling, I see you and you keep going back to what you're doing. Because you know they're fed and watered and entertained and right now they're just wanting your attention. You know, it's a bit like that with your thoughts where you say, yes, I hear that train of thought and back to the breath. Yes, I hear that train of thought and back to behind it or in between it. You know, and so the kind of the visual aspects of these things, it's not like you're using visuality in general or that you're actually using the eye senses. It's just kind of to give you a mental impression of what you're trying to touch. Does it make sense? So if you use sky and clouds, that imagery is so familiar to us. And the idea that even when there's weather, above the weather there is clarity, we already understand that we get that. Um, it's kind of, you know, metaphoric and poetic and nice. If we bring that idea to the mind, is there some relationship that you can touch when you're sitting in those meditations? Something that is moving and something that is still. Something that is clouded, something that is clear. Simultaneous, you're just shifting what you emphasize. As we do these meditations, do you know? Yeah, Talia, yeah. Oh, muting. I wanted to ask, is there a physical feeling to it, kind of, that comes up? Something, I don't know, I was thinking of something, I, I can, can't even describe it in a sense, but something like gentle or... Um, Absolutely. The, the relationship between body and mind, it, for us, is very intertwined, even though the mind is not the body. What happens is that the more you focus the mind in a very clear attention that has no stress to it, the more the body goes into like its natural state. So the energy system kind of releases and relaxes. So for us at our level, the kind of the main energy channels, the center, the right and the left, are coiled at different points, you know, the chakras, right? And right now they're coiled quite tightly around the central channel and the flow is not smooth at all. The more that we have focus together with relaxation, the more those channels release a bit, and the more smooth the flow is, and the more the mind is, the body is almost like, like a little bit blissful. And yeah, there's some kind of gentle peace. Um, there can even be kind of, there can even be like a rush of bliss, but sometimes it's just like a, a deep settling that is different than sleepy relaxed. It's kind of like bright relaxed, yeah, invigorated relaxed. So this is the, the, the kind of the sweet spot we're trying to hit with every meditation is to break the association between focus and stress. Because for us, we can be focused a lot, but the focus is always related to stress for the most part, unless we're doing something that we really, really enjoy. But we associate strong focus with stress and we need to break that association. We associate relaxation with sleep and we think of them as the same and relaxation and sleep are not the same thing. We need to break that association. So what we're trying to bring to the meditative process is focus with relaxation on any number of objects. And on this case, you're starting with the breath because the breath is accessible, tangible and known. And you do that long enough that the surface relaxate or the surface distractions settle. So your immediate worries, your immediate fears, your immediate hopes, your plans, they have to kind of chatter and run around for a while. And then you go, okay, I'll come back to you later if you're important. And a lot of you aren't important and can just dissolve. 
you know, so that's why we start with the breath because it's accessible and it helps the surface distractions settle. And then when you release focus on the breath, that's where it gets a little bit intriguing because what exactly are you focused on? It's so natural to fall into like vagueness. You know, that's, that's the danger is that you fall into kind of a sleepy, comfy, vague haze and then name it meditation when, no, that's not meditation. Yeah. Sleepy, hazy, vague. If you're actually fighting sleep, stop the meditation and sleep and then come back to your meditation. So if you're fighting sleep, like you're really nodding, um, you know, try having your eyes open, try, you know, any number of things that will wake you up, but really you might just need sleep. <laughs> so rather than have a battle with it, just sleep. Um, but you know, these, when you're opening into focus that is not the breath, start with content without becoming obsessed with content. Does that make sense? It's a bit like free associating, but you're not really talking back to it or labeling it or anything like that. You're just watching. Okay. And then, you know, as you watch, it slows. As, as you watch, it becomes more obvious where there is space. And then you're able to shift emphasis to the space. So the general process of a clarity of mind meditation, is it, is it basically clear to you guys? And there is one in your text, just kind of the basic steps and kind of basically what you're aiming for, even if you're not successful, but you know kind of where you're going, or are there some, some confusion or questions about that to, to flesh out? Yuntin, the clarity is based on the emptiness, right? I mean, uh, uh, if we understand or if we perceive the emptiness, then we can uh, see, or then we can be, uh, then we have this uh, clarity and uh, knowing aspect. No, no. Good news, very good news, is that the clarity and knowing aspect is the relative aspect of the mind already there. Then you, you, you try to get to that, and then see that that is empty. That's the next step that we haven't done as much. Right now we're trying to just get to the clear, clarity and knowing as a focal object. Once you get to that and land on that and are able to abide with that, then you bring in your understanding of emptiness to that. That understanding of emptiness doesn't make it clear and knowing, it already is clear and knowing. Mm -hmm. It's just that your surface conceptions cloud it. You know, so your surface conceptions make you not able to access the fact of it, you know, like the weather obscuring the sky. Yeah, so we're trying to get to the sky, but the next step that we haven't done in meditation yet is having gotten to the sky, now we examine the sky, which is a lot more abstract than examining the clouds. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah so, so it's the clarity and knowing is, is the relative nature of the mind, not the ultimate nature of the mind. So it's already there and present. Um, it's, always, it's already an access point for relief and spaciousness before you've realized emptiness. Even just touching the clarity of the mind, your surface afflictive thoughts and reactivity and habituations lose momentum. You know, it's a really useful technique if you're quite stirred up to say, okay, here's the weather. What's behind the weather? What's above the weather? There can still be weather. I don't have to change it. But what, it, what else is there? Or what, in a way, is holding it? Do you know? So when we did, um, or when Venerable SK did main minds and mental factors with you, remember that every main mind has mental factors in its revenue. A minimum of five. Yeah, I'm just going to quick mute. Oops, there's somebody on their mic. There we go. <laughs> but unmute yourself if you want to add anything. Um, you said, yeah. I, yesterday I saw, I watched the um, movie, one of the movies you sent for us, and uh, I he gave an example that our mind is, it wasn't with tea, it wasn't, it was with water, that our mind is like, all the time like this, <laughs> with the, a glass of water. Exactly. But when it stops, all this shaking, maybe it will help us to see the clear knowing uh, mind. Exactly. And I like this example, you know, about, I know. 
Yeah, we, we know. Our mind all the time like this, all the time it's shaking the water. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm telling you, yeah. from uh, every semester I have to ask it again, so please uh, bear with me. Is uh, the emptiness of mind can be said that it's totally, totally dependent of many, many things. Is it synonym like? Um, dependent arising is the reason why things are empty. So it's not a synonym, it's a reason. So it's also dependent totally and also empty. It's empty because it's dependent, because. So there is another quality for the emptiness above being depend totally dependent? Okay, so, so just, just kind of sit with this. All phenomena are empty because they dependently arise. If they didn't dependently arise, they wouldn't be empty. So it's we're saying things are empty of a particular quality they're empty of, okay? So the relative truth of something is deceptive because it seems to be more than what it is. It seems to be telling you its label. That's the seeming, that's the illusion, that's the deceptive quality of the relative. To access its ultimate nature, you have to say where exactly is the solidness that seems to be there? Yeah, so you could take something very simple and unemotional, like, like the cup, and say, this seems to be a cup, and we all agree it's a cup. It's an inherently existent cup because I can drink from it, and it functions as that, right? And that's, you know, that's the way it seems. It's empty of inherent existence because there is no self-existent cup here. Or when we were a child, we would not need to be introduced to the concept of a cup. When we first picked it up as a child, we might think it's a hat and put it on our head. We might think that it's a toy. We might think that it's a weapon. We might think that it's a house. You know, it's not a self-existent cup because we have to be introduced to it. If it inherently existed, it would not need to be named. The name would be self-evident. So the way to access the fact of it not existing from its own side is to look amongst its parts and find there is no part that holds the identity or gives the identity. The identity is placed by conception on this basis and there is nothing more there. It, it is really subtle and keep asking the question again and again, it's really subtle. And um, your next semester is gonna be all about emptiness. It's as so. if you use it like in one breath, emptiness of its inherent existence and totally dependent. It's like they are connected somehow. I would be much easier with Buddhism if you say the whole world is totally, totally in the interconnected and there is nothing stands in itself. It would be great without saying emptiness because I've never met emptiness. Everything is full of everything. So very hard to grasp, but interdependentness, I sign for it now. It, it goes in the right direction. Add it in your head when I say empty. And then there'll be more to the story later. <laughs> but I would like to understand um, why do I need to add emptiness if I have total dependentness? Because without it, you cannot fundamentally uproot suffering and the habits of ignorance. Understanding interdependence can put a lid on certain behaviors. It can prevent them from arising. It can help you be a kind and compassionate person, but it will not fundamentally uproot why it is there is negative habits to begin with, why there is suffering to begin with. So knowing only dependent arising is incredibly powerful, incredibly useful, and will lead to a kind and happier person, but it will never fundamentally uproot the whole problem of why we got this suffering aspect to begin with. So putting a lid on afflictions and suffering is fantastic. We need to be able to do it, but it's not the whole story. Yeah, it's like you're giving medicine to soothe the symptoms of the disease, 
when it would be great to just cut out the tumor and not have the disease. But you know, the, the medicine gives you the impression that the disease is gone, you know, and if you keep taking the medicine and you remember to take your medicine and you never miss a day or a moment, it's as if you're cured. But we all know as soon as we lose mindfulness of interdependence, immediately anger can come and attachment can come. So the disease is just ready to pop up the second we forget to take the medicine of dependent arising. The emptiness of the mind as clear and knowing is its emptiness is because it needs de uh, uh, de develop, uh, developing, purifying. It, it's just two qualities, right? So it's, it's two qualities that the mind has. The mind has two aspects. The relative aspect is that it's clarity and awareness. The ultimate aspect is that it lacks inherent existence. Because of its relative nature, we need to develop compassion, kindness, patience, etc., all the good stuff that we already love. Because of its ultimate nature, we need to see its ultimate nature. So the fact that it has an ultimate nature, emptiness, doesn't mean that we see that, which means we still add onto our impression of mind and our impression of self, which creates dualism, divisiveness, afflictions, etc. So the fact of the mind's emptiness exists whether we know it or not. We don't even understand the relative aspect of the mind yet, let alone its ultimate aspect. So for us at our level, our first step is just to try and touch the relative aspect of the mind, that there is more and deeper and subtler than just the surface chaotic thinking and conceptualizations. There is something that is clarity and awareness. Maybe those words are confusing and you could think reflective. Yeah, the mind is able to reflect phenomena or observe phenomena. Now the mental factors are what decide what that phenomena is. If it's good or bad, if it wants more of it or less than it. But the mind's basic ability to just merely reflect isn't in and of itself that agitating. It's actually incredibly peaceful. So whether you think of the main mind or the primary consciousness as like water or as like sky or as like a mirror, it's the same impression we're trying to bring to it that it's clarity doesn't mean emptiness. It's clarity means a reflective ability to cognize. Yeah, the ability to cognize, the ability to know. Now, the mental factors decide what to do with that knowing, that observation, for lack of a better word, even though it's not necessarily with sight. Yeah, so the relative truth of something and the ultimate truth of something live in the same place at the same time. They're two sides, they're two aspects of the same phenomena. They're not the same. Dependent arising and emptiness are not the same. Things are empty because they're dependent. I, I, but, thought, of the, I thought of the inherent existence. Even the word existence that still exists means that it's relative. There's still exactly. some kind of existence. And in emptiness, I don't know what there is, but <laughs> it's, it doesn't There's exist. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, exists, you know, yeah, relatively. It exists relatively. In, in emptiness, there is no coming and going, right? In emptiness, there is no this or that. But that doesn't mean in emptiness, there is nothing. It's, it's like raw potentiality. Um, the, the easiest way to understand emptiness is to think of it as like the way space is. Emptiness is not space, don't get confused, but the way that space is, is that it allows for things to move within it. it. You know, if there was no space in the cup, you couldn't pour water into the cup. The space in the cup gives its ability to hold. The, the emptiness of the mind gives it its ability to transform. But the, the emptiness is the ultimate uh... yes okay yeah it's not the relative no okay. when you hear ultimate think emptiness yes okay i get confused yep. now okay. yep when you hear <laughs> ultimate think emptiness 
when you hear relative, think deceptive. <laughs> yeah. But you can clear really true. Hmm? One time, clear and knowing is not deceptive, and yet it's a related truth. So can you explain it a little bit more? Clear and knowing is, is you know, it has a deceptive aspect in that it has the impression of inheritance, but it's not deceptive in the sense that it's able to cognize its objects. So you can say that um, the mind is able to perceive, you know, blue, I primary consciousness, meeting with the eye sense power, meeting with the form and shape of something blue, those things coming together, you can have an impression of blueness. But then the mental factors add to the deception by saying that blue is inherently existent blue from its own side. So and your eye primary consciousness, despite seeing blue, it is carrying with it the connotation that it's self-existent blue. And then the, the mental factors are like making it worse because they're saying it's my blue, it's good blue, it's your blue, it's, you know, everyone sees the same blue that I see, et cetera, et cetera. But even the main mind itself, though it's clear and knowing, it doesn't mean that it's knowing all or completely clear. It's just talking about an aspect. Yeah. Is it the duality aspect you mean? That it's inherent in the clear and knowing aspect of the mind? Can you say it again? Say it again? I think it's important what you're saying. I just uh, mental it. factor are uh, in, in some way uh, two minds, like this is a duality aspect. And by that, it's a relative uh, truth. It's getting there. Did you mean that? It's, it's, it's more than that. The, the main minds have a duality as well, right? The mental factors have a more obvious dualistic way of approaching things. The, men, the main minds are also dualistic because there's still an idea of subject and object. Yeah. So, so don't, don't confuse the words clear and knowing with accuracy. Okay. Yeah. Don't confuse it with accuracy. It's that it's able to hold something and cognize something. Um, it's like you can s look in a mirror and see your face in the mirror, but if you were a cat, you would believe it's another cat. Mm. So that you're seeing, but the seeing doesn't mean accuracy. Yeah, you're seeing a face in the mirror, but you don't believe there's a whole extra face there that looks exactly like you. And you're like, oh, my twin, you know? But nevertheless, it appears that way, and that is an accurate seeing. It's just not an accurate apprehending. Okay. Yeah. So we're like cats. <laughs> yeah. Where we, we, you know, we're seeing the reflection. The reflection is there, but we're also apprehending there's some other whole thing happening there. Is, is emptiness different from... Um being uh, clear and knowing? It's, yes. Yes. I mean, if, if you say that knowing uh, or perceiving uh, emptiness is, I, I think, in a way, uh, knowing it or being mindful of it at all times, the fact that what you uh, see um, or what you uh, perceive um, is uh, just um, seems like it's like it, it exists. Things do exist. So it is knowing clearly. No, you're, you're mixing things all together, right? That's the problem that's happening, is that the, the concepts are getting all merged together as if it's one thing that's being talked about. There's, there's separate things being discussed. Don't mush them together or you'll get confused, okay? So there are two truths to everything, okay? There's two truths to everything. There's its relative truth and its ultimate truth. That's true of the mind, that's true of the self, that's true of the book, that's true of your cat. Okay, everything has two aspects, two qualities. When we're looking at the mind as the thing that we're investigating, 
the mind's relative aspect is that it's clear and knowing. It's clarity and awareness. That's its nature. Okay? It's relative nature. That's what it does in the relative world, right? It's able to reflect things. It's able to know things. To say no doesn't mean that it accurately knows. To say clear doesn't mean that it's free from obscurations. It, you know, water or sky or mirror, all of these are very good analogies. Just because it reflects doesn't mean it knows what it reflects or, you know, does the right things with what it reflects, but it is able to reflect. Okay, so that's just the relative nature of the mind. It's clarity and awareness. It's clear and knowing nature. That's relative. That mind that is clear and knowing has an ultimate aspect. Its ultimate aspect is the fact that it's empty of inherent existence. It's not empty, empty. It's empty of existing in an independent way in and of itself, self-created. The problem is that we have the clear and knowing mind and then we have an impression that it made itself, that it owns itself, it possesses itself, that it perpetuates itself, and that is incorrect, the fact, despite the fact that there is continuity. One moment of mind leads to the next moment of mind, but it is an interdependent phenomena, not a self-created phenomena. Okay, so to realize emptiness is to realize that despite there being existence, there is no independence. Things can exist without being independent. Right now it seems that everything has an independent existence and is some kind of oneness or unityness or has even an aspect of permanence to it as if there's a core that never changes and add-ons that we allow to change. That's not the case at all. There is no core like that. But there is experience. Yeah? So when we're looking at the mind, the, the, the Buddha nature right, has two sides, right? The relative aspect of Buddha nature and the ultimate aspect of Buddha nature related to the relative and ultimate aspects of the mind, yeah? Which then turns into the two kinds of Buddha bodies, yeah? So when you... you can say it again, Yunte, please. You can say it again slowly, more slowly. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's important points. It's important points. So, okay, so the mind has a relative aspect and an ultimate aspect, which means that's its causal level. Its resultant level will be a relative aspect and an ultimate aspect of its Buddha nature, and its fully realized Buddha nature, its Buddha bodies. Okay, so because the mind is empty of inherent existence, we have to realize that by repeating emptiness meditations. When we repeat our emptiness meditations thoroughly, and we cut the root of samsara, and we overcome all the seeds of having assumed a samsaric existence, then we have the truth bodies for our own sake. The dharmakayas, the jhana dharmakaya and the svabhavikakaya. Those two truth bodies are the result of the ultimate nature of the mind. One aspect of that is natural, is permanent. That aspect is the emptiness of the mind. Okay, the other side of it is the, related to the relative nature of the mind, the clear and knowing aspect of the mind. Yeah, so the mind's being clear and knowing it's, is its relative truth and has a deceptive quality and we need to develop merit on the basis of the relative which means despite there being deceptiveness to relative truth, we still need to function in the world. And so we need to function in the world with an acknowledgement of the ultimate, but still behave in the relative, which means what? Compassion, kindness. Yeah, in all of its forms, in all of its incarnations, whether it's work or professional or whatever, we have to practice compassion and loving kindness to develop the relative side of the mind, the relative side of our Buddha nature, which will lead to the relative transformation into the Buddha bodies related to the relative. The form bodies. The form bodies. Yeah, the rupakayas. 
there are two types, right? The Nirmanakaya and the Sambhogakaya. But those types are related to then being a benefit to sentient beings who still cling to deceptive appearances. So for the sake of those who still cling to deceptive appearances, we need to manifest a deceptive appearance to help move them in the right direction. Does that make sense? We need, to we need to develop a compassion and kindness. Can you say more about that in the relative? In the relative, it's, it's, it's like compassion and kindness are nice and make sense and are ethical. That's kind of easy enough for us to relate to. But because things are interdependent, not only is it nice, it's logical, right? And not only is it logical, it's closer to ultimate truth than we've been before, because you're realizing that because nothing exists in and of itself independently, that must mean that it's interconnected and interrelated. So what helps them helps me, what helps me helps them, and it's all an interconnected yada, yada, yada. But even the whole sense of them and me is dualistic and still related to the you know, relative deceptive way that we see the world. But re recognizing interconnection and interdependence is much closer to ultimate truth than we were. So to live with the relative with less deception and with more benefit, we practice compassion and loving kindness, wanting others to be free from suffering, wanting them to have happiness, doing what seems skillful to help bring that about, while at the same time knowing that there is fundamentally not anything that is good or bad in and of itself, and yet ethics are essential. That razor's edge, right? That razor's edge is, is hard to say, okay, I'm going to do good, kind things to help make people happy is excellent, but then when you actually go about living in that way, what actually is happiness, what actually works, none of it exists independent from context, does it? And yet it's still the right way to live. And it still develops the mental momentum that develops the transforming Buddha nature into the form bodies that we need to benefit others. Yeah, Dorian? Can you repeat, please, uh, the meaning of um, Dharmakaya? Truth body related to the emptiness of the mind. What, what is a truth body? Uh, it's not the... Uh, the body that we see, absolutely. No, it's a body in the nature of mind. Um, it is a formless body. It's a truth body related to wisdom. So the two aspects of the Dharmakaya, the two, form, the two truth bodies, one, is, one side is related to the fact that the mind is empty. The other is related to recognizing and developing the fact that the mind is empty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And having done that, you have a body for yourself, a body for your own welfare, meaning you no longer suffer. Mm. Yeah, so the truth bodies are for your own sake. The form bodies are for the sake of others. A complete Buddha has both. Mm. Someone who's abiding only in nirvana has as if a dharmakaya only, even though technically there's more to say about that. But it's... A body. it's a yeah, go ahead. A body is a realized potential? In this context, fully, yes. Fully realized potential? This is a, a body? Yeah, you could say it that way. Yeah. yeah. So the Dharma kind of sounds like form, but don't, don't get confused. It doesn't mean that there's always a form to the body. It's, you know, like a, it's the closest we can get with words <laughs> to describing what we mean. But it's the dharmakayas are bodies in the nature of mind. The form bodies are also bodies in the nature of mind, but can take the aspect of form in order to relate to sentient beings with deceptive appearances. So we can say that the two bodies of the dharmakaya, if I can say so, is the compassion and the wisdom, both of them. The wisdom by understanding the emptiness and the interbeingness. And by that, getting uh, resulting in compassion and compassion, like the method. Um, nearly. Um, the two Dharma bodies, the two truth bodies, they are both for your own sake. Um, you have emptiness 
and you realize emptiness that has two dharmakaya aspects. The other side are the form bodies, the rupakayas, and those result from the practice of compassion and kindness, etc. The things related to the relative, to the method side. But so, you, you have to be a Buddha to, to you have to be a Buddha for uh, the Rupakayas, yes? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Only a Buddha has all four Buddha bodies. Um, we're, you know, we're developing into those four bodies by practicing method and wisdom. Yeah. So, you know, you just keep going back up and down through that initial chart from the beginning of the semester. You know, the, the bodies come from the practice come from the truth, all right? The truth, relative and ultimate, leads to the path, method and wisdom. Method and wisdom lead to the bodies, the form bodies and the truth bodies. So you can divide it into two or divide it into four. There's a lot of ways to subdivide the, the bodies, but to remember that one category is related to ultimate truth, one category is related to, to relative truth. And those all come from practicing method and wisdom because of understanding the two truths. I, I want to ask, what, what, how do you describe the mind of a Buddha? I think it, will, it, helps, it may help me to understand. How do you describe the mind of the Buddha uh, concerning the main mind and mental factors? There are no mental factors anymore? So the mind of the Buddha and the main mind are, is only mental con con consciousness or what happens? Uh... Yeah, you can say it like that. You can say it like that. Um, the, the mind of a Buddha is omniscience. Yeah, omniscience. So all knowing, all knowing. Yeah. Um, omnipotent, not necessarily in the God sense, but in the sense of if there is ability to benefit, it is able to do that benefit. You know, so if a sentient being has an opening for transformation, immediately the Buddha is there helping bring out that transformation in whatever form they have the karma to relate to. So, you know, the, the, the word body is, is problematic and confusing, like the word emptiness is problematic and confusing, and it's as good as we get with language. So, so all of these bodies are coming from a purified mind. Don't think of it as physical, you know, like now I suddenly have four separate bodies walking around and I have to keep them organized and make sure that they're all on the same schedule and, you know, don't, don't make it too concrete. You know, it's because of how your mind is that you can then go on to manifest things for self and others. You don't really have to manifest anything for yourself because you've achieved the result of having practiced ultimate truth. You don't suffer anymore. You're not in any pain. You don't have afflictions. You don't have afflictive responses. You don't have bias or preferences towards people. You want to benefit everyone equally and you're happy. Yeah, that's kind of the way the Dharmakaya is <laughs> for a Buddha. You are happy, you are able. Yeah, and that is now your baseline experience all the time. Continuous happiness, continuous ability to be of benefit, continuous altruism, nothing interrupts it, nothing gives you suffering. Your whole life is about altruism and that whole process is joyful. What omniscience is like, what omnipotence is like, who knows, but it sounds great. Could be overwhelming, who knows, but no more suffering, I think not too bad. Um, what the form bodies are like, they're like when, you know, the most ordinary of sense, you know, maybe that we can relate to is that with some groups of friends, we adopt a certain aspect and with other groups of friends, we adopt a different aspect. You know, if I'm talking to the nuns at the nuns community at Chenrezig, then we're, um, you know, we're polite and tidy and talk about Dharma and, you know, sometimes talk about logistics and, you know, there's a certain content and aspect to the conversation. Then when I'm home in Montana, I might be, I don't know, sitting in a more relaxed way. I might be wearing a sweater instead of this on the top to be a bit more relatable. Um, I might use more slang and colloquialisms. The content of the conversation is different. I'm trying, not always successfully, but I'm trying in both contexts to be loving, compassionate, and present. 
but it looks different depending on the two different groups, right? It looks different. Even if the heart open, you know, one is my family, the other is my family. My nun family, my family family. They're my family, I love them, I want to bring benefit. But I'm not gonna talk about the same things or be in the same way, despite having the same mentality. So for a Buddha, they know what is exactly relatable to the sentient being in front of them. They know that the quote form body for this sentient being is gonna to need to be a book or a bridge or some aspect of nature or a dog or a sound or music. For this sentient being, it's going to be a literal physical teacher explaining Dharma in steps. You know, this is the way the Buddha is able to operate through form. Does that make sense? So they take the aspect of what is needed even though their compassion is infinite and unbiased. So, you know, so we already do a version of that in our very, very basic way of just responding to the people in front of us, trying to communicate in words that they understand, trying to communicate in ways that they relate to, while generally speaking, wanting to be kind and nice to everyone, right? Just a very basic, basic, basic question. But how do, what is the, how do you say, what is transformation? Out of affliction and suffering into something with less affliction and suffering? Is it a one thing or every step is transformative? I mean, I guess the question becomes, what's the difference between transformation and change? Because there's change in every moment, but transformation is more intentional and orchestrated. So when we talked about the five paths, remember the path of accumulation, the path of preparation, the path of seeing, the path of meditation, the path of no more learning. There is transformation happening all along the way, but we name and give a heading to specifically significant points of transition even though there's transition happening continuously as soon as someone has decided to practice and is practicing. Yeah, so right now we are transforming, we're practicing, we're thinking about things deeply and we're trying to live in resonance with the new conclusions we've come to. Sometimes we're distracted, sometimes it's imperfect, but there is transformation happening as the result of mentality and cognition, right? And so that continues and it gathers momentum and it goes deeper and deeper. And then we say, from this transition to this transition, we could say you've moved from the path of accumulation to the path of seeing. You know, similarly in psychology, you talk about what cognitive shifts or, you know, you know my dad's a great fan of the Ericksonian developmental stages. You know, you've moved from attachment and what, to what and what, you know, and you're moving from these different stages. What is the litmus test? What is the criteria for those? You know, it's something that's in conversation and you have a certain tick list to go through. Buddhism is the same. Um, you know that you've moved from the path of accumulation to the path of preparation when these things are present in your practice. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, so I don't, I don't know. So transformation is a word that I use more than other Buddhist teachers because you guys use the word. Yeah, we would say realizations. Yeah, but to, if you guys start using realizations, then it sounds like more significant things are happening than are actually happening. So it's better to say transformations because even regular people are transforming. Yeah, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, so it's tricky. Is it coming clear or is it getting more confusing? I don't know. I, I know, that, you know, it's the same charts, it's the same content, and just familiarizing, just getting your head around the words takes a while. Um, getting your head around the concepts takes a while, and then you have your own resistance to, do I even feel like it? Is this worth my time? I'm tired, I have other things to do. Or I am really intrigued, but maybe I'm not smart enough. Oh no, that's just some complex. Of course I am, just practice, whatever. You know, like whatever background stuff is happening is happening and just be nice to yourself. Um, these things roll off my tongue because I've been Buddhist since I was 12 years old. It doesn't mean you've I'm just, smart, right? It just means it it's all. familiar. Hmm? You've just said it all. Okay. <laughs> Good. Good. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other, you know, any other thoughts about Buddha bodies? I wanted to ask about the luminous quality that you spoke about last time. Something about how I was thinking about it, how it affects the environment, or there's something about clear and knowing that's focused on you, maybe more your mind. But there's something about this that it's not only you in a sense. I don't know if I'm making sense. But. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure where to go with that, except to say that the more that you are touching it and aware of it, the more you bring that out in others. Just you become a stronger condition for their own process. And that is our work, isn't it? To become a stronger condition for other people's process. And the stronger condition we are, the happier we are, the more fulfilled we are. But it also means that what we bring to a conversation is more powerful. If they're open to it, <laughs> you know, if they're open to it, if it's the right karmic connection, etc. Yeah, so, yeah, the luminosity, this is something that the, the Nyingma and the Kagyu tradition like to talk about more than us in the Galukpa tradition. Um, but they kind of talk about the clear light mind as ground luminosity, as like a fundamental brightness and clarity you can bring to content in a sense. And um, touching that brings it forward, even though it's always there. And so there's all these ways to touch it, whether it's going through in an, imaginated, in an imagined way, the eight stages at the time of death, or whether it's, you know, being with the breath and then bring with, being with the thoughts and then being with the mind behind the thoughts, kind of whatever your access point is. I think it's also good to remember that we have these moments of touching the mind in its more primordial, unfabricated form, kind of just in moments of very steady being. I, you know, can you picture, I don't know if you do this in Israel, some old man sitting on a porch in a rocking chair watching traffic, right? Can you, can you picture this? Like some old man sitting on a porch in his rocking chair, just watching traffic, just really content watching traffic, rocking in his rocking chair. If you asked him, what are you thinking about? He might not say much. He might say, oh, nothing. But he's awake and bright and alert and observing, but there's not necessarily a lot of judgment and framing of all of that. You know that state? I mean, it's not to say that every old man on a rocking chair isn't full of judgment. There might be tons that are saying, what kind of car are you driving? But you know what I mean, like the example. Um, that kind of raw awareness. Um, sometimes first thing in the morning, if you've had a good sleep, yeah, do you ever, do you remember having a good sleep? It might've happened once. You know, you wake up after a good sleep and you just kind of feel a mental freshness, but not lots of words yet, not lots of content yet, just a, a you know, a clear freshness in the morning. That's touching more. Yeah. So we've all touched it. It's just, you know, again, like we've had the experience, but maybe missed the meaning. And now we're just bringing meaning to it so we can bring it forward. So it's a lesson of uh, question and answers. Uh, and I'll continue in that line. If we could uh, penetrate directly to the ultimate level, let's say, uh, then we automatically understand the relative uh, level. I mean, we work uh, in the other direction because it's hard for us to penetrate directly, but let's say we, we could do it. Uh, so the, the relative level will be clear for us, right? Yeah, gradually. What happens is that, excuse me, um, a Buddha can see relative truth and ultimate truth at the same time. Up until being a Buddha, you alternate but one informs the other. So say you'd realized emptiness directly, while you're in meditation on emptiness, only the ultimate appears to your mind. You're only aware of ultimate truth while you're meditating. And then you get up and you live your life and you do your thing and your memory of emptiness colors the way you see the relative. And so it's like the spell is broken. Yeah, the spell of grasping at inherent existence, the veil, the illusion, the spell is broken, but you still see it. So it's like, you know, you went to a magic show and it all looked like it was really magic. And then someone showed you behind the curtain and you saw all the mechanisms that made it happen. 
and then you went back to seeing the show and it still looks like magic, but you don't believe it anymore because you know there's a secret compartment here and a cup there. So it still looks like magic, but you don't believe it. You've broken the spell. So that's the way it would be once we realize emptiness is that while we're not in meditation, still only the relative appears, but we don't buy into it. We don't believe it in the same way. And that changes so much how we respond to it. So knowledge of the ultimate very much helps you with your dealing with the relative. <laughs> yeah. So being um, omniscient, the Buddha being omnis having an omniscient mind, it's not clear and knowing because clear and knowing is, is the relative. It's clear and knowing having been completely developed to its utmost extent. You know, so it was the same basis as our basis. It's, it's transformed and perfected. It's not like it sprung into being something completely different. It was an evolution. Yeah. So the same raw material that we have is the raw material a Buddha has, and they've developed it and transformed it. You know, hence all those analogies that we did the other day. So there are different schools of thought about, you know, what the Buddha's mind is like. There's a lot of different schools of thought. Um, but anyhow, it's not dual. What, what... Yeah, yeah, it's non-dual. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and uh, there is agreement that there is no suffering. <laughs> there is agreement that there is no bias. Because how could there be, you know? Yeah. So, you know, in one sense, these things can seem kind of far away and unrelatable. And on another sense, there is, there is an aspect of our practice that probably touches elements of this and we can see moving in that direction, even if we never framed it that way. You know, even if we didn't use these words or framed it that way, our knowledge of, of wisdom does inform the way that we relate. You know, and that as that knowledge of wisdom develops and integrates, it has a stronger and stronger influence. You know, maybe when you first met psychology in a very basic way, maybe even in high school, you had certain ideas about why people do certain things. You know, oh, when people do that, it's from that. And you were concrete about it and you said always. And then you, you know, met Coat or maybe different other psychological teachers and you came to realize, oh, that is true sometimes in a certain context, not in and of itself, but still it is true sometimes, you know? So it's not like you completely said that thing I learned in high school is wrong, but you realized it's not as right as you thought in the beginning, there's more, you know? And so then that informs how you are then with people, doesn't it? Yeah, if you were newer in your path, you might think all oh, people with drug and alcohol abuse are always, I don't know, have a brain disorder or a genetic component or trauma, <laughs> always. And that is the only reason that ever happens when you're concrete about it. And then you met clients where different things were the case and you th thought, okay, well that's often the case, but maybe not always. And you know, now there's flexibility and there's more movement with how you interact. You know? So it's not like you discard your prior knowledge, it just your prior knowledge expands into more possibilities until then there is just space of infinite possibilities. Um, my old Zen teacher used to say to me, whenever I thought I understood, and I was like, so it's like this, he would say, not always necessarily. <laughs> For everything, it was so annoying, so Zen and annoying, but it was quite useful because it was almost that very need to make things concrete and to say always and never was the symptom of dualistic thinking. And so him saying, not always made me go, but okay. You know, it doesn't mean never, it just means not always. <laughs> Release. Okay. Yeah, other thoughts or questions? It's, it's, it's good to have a back and forth. So please add if you've got any ads. Should we um, continue a bit more than how to meditate on these things? So, um, page 65, um, where it says Zogchen and Mahamudra. Um, and those reflections that are just above it, um, they're worth thinking about and the answers to them are just in the reading, you know, prior to it. So um, do, you know, go back over those things if you can't remember. But, um, so Zogchen and Mahamudra, it says, according to Sutra, meditation on the clear and cognizant nature of the mind 
or on the transforming Buddha nature alone will not eradicate afflictions. However, it does lead us to have more confidence that afflictions are not an inherent part of the mind and therefore that becoming a Buddha is possible. So this relates a little bit to what Orna was saying, yeah? This in turn leads us to question, what defiles the mind and what can eliminate these defilements completely? Seeking the method to purify the transforming Buddha nature, we will cultivate the wisdom realizing emptiness of inherent existence and eradicate ignorance. According to Zogchen and Mahamudra, meditation on the clear and cognizant nature of the mind could lead the coarse winds to dissolve and the subtlest clear light mind to become manifest. Okay, so meditating on the clear and knowing nature of the mind, yeah, the spacious clarity, the sky-like, mirror-like, water-like nature of the mind, that itself can help the coarse winds to dissolve. What does that mean? The coarse winds mean the subtle energy system. That means that unlocking and that relaxing of the channel knots at the chakras. When you see winds described in Tibetan Buddhism, it's basically the same as when you hear qi described in Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine. Yeah, qi, winds, subtle energy system, these are relatively synonymous. Yeah, they might even be perfectly synonymous. I just don't know enough about the other traditions to say definitively. So when you see winds, don't think wind and don't think breath. Think it's talking about very subtle energy. Okay, so it's a little bit like what Talia described with meditating on the clarity of the mind, that the body has a gentling and a relaxing that happens. That's a result of the coarse winds dissolving or releasing or settling, however you want to describe that. So what you're doing is you're shifting your focus from the afflictions to the less afflicted. It still has ignorance, but it's not so jarring. It's not so stirred up like the swarm of bees, right? It's not so agitated. And just by shifting the emphasis to that other aspect, the body coordinates and the subtle energy system coordinates. Yeah, and you can try that out experientially. You know, that's not something that you have to just take on as an idea, just play with it and see if it happens. You know, and maybe it already has. Yeah. Yeah, is this also the the single pointed or not? Is yeah, this single pointed. Like this meditation is also single pointed. It's not only the meditation on the clear, on the spacious. It's no, it, yeah, it's like if you were to do the meditation on the stages of at the time of death, you would arrive to the point of touching the clear light and then stay single pointedly. So your analysis would arrive at a single pointedness. And once you've arrived at the single pointedness, you often have that release of the coarse winds as if dissolving. Okay, and then the subtlest clear light mind becomes manifest. So, you know, by trying to identify the clear and knowing nature of the mind, the sky-like nature of the mind, the winds start to dissolve. And as the winds dissolve, then the actual clear light mind becomes as if manifest. So you take what you imagine to be the case, hold your attention steadily on what you imagine to be the case and what you have, you know, whiffs of experience of. And that is enough for the mind and the winds to settle enough for the actual clear light mind, the actual fundamental consciousness to become more obvious to you, to become more manifest. For it to be fully manifest and obvious to you actually takes a great deal of you know, time and um, a lot of components to it. But what it's saying basically is don't think just because you're imagining it, that it's not having a direct impact on experience or that it's not bringing you closer to what is actually the case. By rehearsing the stages of death, you actually become better at manipulating the stages of death. So it's not just that you're becoming more familiar with the stages of death and then you're less scared at the time of death, it's not just that you become familiar with them and you're reminded to set your motivation and to try and meditate on the clear light mind. It is that, and it's more. By rehearsing it, you actually get closer to developing control over it. And with each of those stages comes a subtler level of mind being manifest. 
and the subtler the mind is, the less distracted and swayed it is by your senses, the more usable and functional it becomes when you direct it towards emptiness or you direct it towards compassion. In this sense, we want to be directing it towards emptiness. But, you know, to think that at our ordinary level, what mo mostly distracts us is our senses. If those senses had kind of absorbed how much more powerful our meditation would be. So you rehearse and that ripens the ability. Rehearsing brings reality closer. So it's, it's really saying, don't think that it's just imagination. By imagining the clear light nature of the mind, you actually begin to access the clear light nature of the mind. But the nice fact of all of this is, is that the subtler, the mind that becomes manifest, the more pleasant and peaceful your natural experience. And that's before even developing it. You know, it's, it's really good news. It's like, your natural state is actually a very contented, peaceful state. And even just living there or touching that more regularly would lead to such a difference in the way of life. And then how much more so if you actually develop that to its fullest extent. But to think even without fiddling with it or manufacturing it or becoming an amazing meditator, just accessing the deeper level of your mind, there is spaciousness and bliss and peace. Um, it's really good news. So, okay. So when this happens, practitioners who have previously cultivated a correct understanding of emptiness, then incorporate that understanding in their meditation and use the innate clear light mind to realize emptiness and abolish afflictions. Okay. So this is just the essence of the meditation that we need to be moving into. So this is our uh, introduction to the upgrade. Yeah, like I was describing before, up until this point, we've been just getting to the mind. Now, once we get to the mind, we're going to see that the mind is empty. So, you know, big circle. This is the instruction on how to do Mahamudra meditation. Okay. And realizing emptiness abolishes the afflictions. Okay. It is important to understand the sublime continuum directly from a Zogchen and Mahamudra point of view. Some people take it literally. Remember, the sublime continuum is the text from Maitreya that was revealed by a Sangha that we've been looking at when we're looking at Buddha nature. So some people take it literally, leading to, an, to them to incorrectly believe that primordial wisdom is permanent, inherently existent, independent of any other factors, and does not rely on causes and conditions. Because in the sublime continuum, it's saying that the Buddha nature is naturally present and you don't have to look for it anywhere else. Right? So it's easy to like take that literally in the sense of missing the rest of the story, because what it's talking about is that the emptiness of the mind is always there. It's perfect, it's pure, it's always been perfect and pure, and you still have to develop and transform the relative aspect. You know, so some people take it too literally and think, you're already a Buddha, don't have to do any work, you just have to reveal, there's a grand reveal and then magic, you're a Buddha, you know, and that's, that's not the whole story. Okay, so just, you know, the reason I mentioned that, and I've mentioned it before, is that you will meet some, some Buddhist teachers who frame things in that way that's overly simplistic, and it can lead to confusion and obstacles on the path. And so if you come across teachers who explain it in that kind of overly simplistic way, in the background, you'll know that there's more to the story. Okay, so over the page, it says, oh, over the page next week, <laughs> over the page next week. So we'll just sit for a second and let course conception settle that we dedicate all of this energy to our awakening so that we can be of benefit to all. Okay. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs>